Hi, Jimmy here. Uh, you find me once again in the former churchyard, uh, now a lovely green space with gravestones and a pub over the road on Bishop Hill Senior in York. It's a lovely little place. If you like green spaces combined with pints, it's sort of ideal. Um, today we're going to be talking about hand tools uh, and before we do, I just want to reassure everybody, I'm not going to steal any cats. Some people were worried that I was being serious about stealing the cat that I made friends with. It's somebody's pet. Don't be daft. We're talking about tools today, hand tools in the Viking Age. There's this misconception a lot of people seem to have that um, people in the past made really rough lumpen objects. And although that was the case, we have fairly roughly made artifacts from all over the place, um, as is the case today. You know, you have apprentice craftspeople, journeyman craftspeople, master craftspeople, and people who just pick up an axe and have a crack at making stuff in the back garden. And that was the case a thousand years ago, plus. Um, but we do also have amazing collections and assemblages that show that master craftspeople were at work, and you need only go into any museum with Viking Age displays to see things uh, like swords, weapons, jewellery, shoes, furniture, and personal items that are beautifully crafted. Um, even earlier stuff as well, you know, you go, you go to any Roman display and there's magnificent, almost microscopic carvings on rock crystal, uh, the inlaid garnets of the Sutton Hoo helmet that are millimetres across, uh, the filigree gold work on crucifixes and uh, penanula brooches in the National Museum of Ireland. And one of the best assemblages we have of tools from the Viking Age um, is from a place called Mestemir in Sweden. And Mestemir uh, was a basically a drained lake. <clears throat> and a couple of days before this video was meant to come out, I received in the post from the wonderful Ali this book about the Mestemir find. And it has a wonderful catalogue inside it of all of the different uh, artefacts. It's got lovely images at the back of, of all of the tools and things found in the Mestemir chest. So thank you, Ali, for this. Uh, so this video was delayed because I was reading this as an extra source. And uh, my new cat friend is stalking around. He's great. Um, so many cat friends around this part of town. The Mestemir chest is what I want to focus on for a bit in this video because it, it really illustrates the breadth of skills that Viking Age craftspeople had. And it gives us a little bit of an insight into the way that crafts were practiced because the interpretation of the Mestemir chest is that it was owned by an itinerant blacksmith. And that means that this is a blacksmith who goes around plying their trade. Uh, you think of sort of caravans in role-playing games where they go from town to town selling stuff. This is somebody who goes from place to place fixing stuff and making stuff. Uh, it might be difficult for you to access skilled craftspeople who can fix things for you. There might not be a local blacksmith's forge. And so a, an enterprising blacksmith might get a horse, get a cart, get a couple of mates and go to you. And that means that they can charge what they want as well. Um, but the Mestemir chest, if it was owned by one or more of these craftspeople, contains well over a hundred artifacts. There's 200 odd artifacts associated with it. It's a big oak chest, uh, nearly a meter long, and he's on the hunt. Good boy. And uh, it has a lock. So it was a locked oak chest and it contains tools and components. Uh, amongst the tools and components we find in there are carpentry tools. So we have things like uh, broad axes for chopping wood, uh, smaller axes for trimming, and a couple of adzes. And adzes are relatively rare finds from the Viking Age. They're not used as much uh, as things like um, things like axes. And we also have uh, a lovely hand saw with an ash handle. Some of the wood has survived in this wonderful boggy. Uh, environment that it was in. We have uh, rasps and files and then we have lots of blacksmithing tools and we've got things like uh, forge tongs, half meter long forge tongs, 56 centimeter long tongs, smaller tongs, uh, a pair of sheet metal snips, so tin snips, metal snips, um, lump hammers, sledge hammers, uh, we've got round files, square files, gouges, drills, bradles, scrapers, um, 
what look like underlays and trivets for putting under work that you're working, especially if it's hot, you need to put it on something, you put it on them. Um, there's also big interesting stuff in there, stuff like a steel yard, which is basically an asymmetrical scale. And it's, we've got a hook on one end and then a weight is suspended off the other end of this long horizontal bar with a loop at the top for suspending it off a chain. Um, so you can weigh whatever it is that you're making or fixing or selling or doing. You can weigh all sorts of things with them. And um, the other big thing in it is the fire basket. And this is basically a grill, that, like a sort of a series of, of bars in a, in a frame suspended from chains at each corner up to a central suspension device like hooks uh, which is then suspended off a chain on a tripod over a fire it looks like that and these things are brilliant they're very versatile they can be used for cooking obviously they can be used for cooking they could be used for uh, heating up uh, metals and that sort of thing some of the pieces in the chest have been interpreted as scrap metal. Uh, so we have things like bronze cauldrons, uh, various lumps and bits of iron and copper alloy uh, that have been interpreted as scrap. Maybe you melt some of it down, use it to patch stuff, beat it out into a sheet, make a patch and some rivets for somebody, you patch up their old cauldron, that sort of thing. Um, there are also padlocks, keys and padlock components, which speaks to somebody's crafts. So. Are these scrap for a blacksmith or are these components and spare parts and commissioned pieces that were being made by a locksmith who was accompanying this chest? Because there is an assumption that this was owned by a blacksmith, but it could have been a blacksmith, a carpenter and a locksmith. Makes sense. Um, we also have things like draw knives. Um, I think we've got a bowl scorp as well for making the inside of bowls. And it speaks to the versatility of the craftspeople who used and owned these tools that you could make bowls, boats, clench bolts, four boats, rivets, uh, cooking ware, tools, weapons. You could repair all of the above with the tools in this box and the tools in the box are very familiar to all of the traditional carpenters, woodworkers, blacksmiths that I have met. They look like and work like the tools that I used today in those crafts. So there's this amazing continuity of form of things like the axes and hammers and sledgehammers, uh, even things like the saw blades, uh, the spoon gouges, the draw knives. If you go to a shop today and you buy a draw knife instead of commissioning it from a toolsmith, it will look like the draw knives in the Mestemir chest. <clears throat> Incidentally, if you're in the UK and you want replicas of, of Viking Age tools, um, there's a chap that I get some of mine from called Dennis, Dennis Riley, he runs Daygrad Tools. Uh, he's not sponsored this video or anything, but he's a decent bloke and he makes nice tools. Um, so the Mestemir chest is, I believe, the biggest assemblage of these tools that we have from the Viking Age. And they are owned by somebody who is probably not necessarily doing a lot of decorative work. There are a couple of stamps and stamp plates in there with classic um, hourglass or double triangle stamps. Uh, there's also a molding iron used for making moldings on wood. So if you think about crown moldings, this is a, a tool that you, it basically works like a draw knife and you draw it across the wood. And as you draw it across the wood, it forms the shape of the molding with a specifically shaped and cut blade on the draw knife that you draw this molding uh, into the wood using. So there is decorative stuff being done here. We're not talking the Osseberg figurehead. Uh, we're not talking the Tara brooch, but there is decorative work being done. They've got the tools, the tools we used. So these people may have been um, fixing stuff up for these local farmers and saying, and by the way, if you, if, do, you want, do you want some bit of decoration into it? Do you want some? Something nice, do you want some moulding on this wood for your, whatever it may be, for your door lintel? Because um, there is this other misconception that people in the past, uh, common people, let's say, in the past, didn't have access to beauty. That's not true. That's not the case. Beauty was everywhere. Beauty was accessible. Uh, beautiful crafting was accessible and beautifully made and decorated wares were accessible. Uh, even if that decoration was just three stamped, hourglass shapes on the back of your knife, whatever it may be. Um, three ring and dot designs 
scratched into the hilt of your knife that you used to eat your dinner with. It's still beauty. Um, Interestingly, that really common ring and dot that you, you get on decorated items in the Viking Age with the two point, like the compasses that you use to make a ring and dot, uh, there isn't, as far as we can tell, anything in the Mestimir chest that makes that. Um, but it is the most commonly found decorative motif on certainly Old Norse artefacts. Uh, a couple of tools are missing from the Mestimir chest that we get in other places. We have other tool chests um, from other contexts. Interestingly, uh, Graves that contain tool chests and collections of tools tend not to have weapons in the same way. Um, so rarely will you find a grave that could be a blacksmith and master craftsman, or it could be a warrior grave. Um, the two tend not to cross over as much, which kind of makes sense when you think about it. Um, people that can lift a sword uh, and people that can lift a spear and stab are ten a penny, but people who are master craft uh, master craftsmen are much, much rarer and worth saving. Uh, anyway, that's just a bit of fun. But uh, we have other tools that are missing from the Mestimir chest. Tools like planes, wood planes. Uh, wood planes obviously are essential tools for a lot of carpentry projects. They shave off wood and help you to smooth the wood. And similarly to adzes, uh, planes are less common than axes, tool axes from Viking Age contexts. Uh, we do have several. We have some from Hythabu, from Hedeby. Uh, we've got a lovely plane from Hedeby. We've also got planes from Dublin. And the Dublin planes, plural, some of them are really nicely decorated with like animal heads or they've got runic inscriptions on them. Uh, most are missing the metal, the, the sole plate, the base plate underneath and the blade. Where we've got the base plate, uh, some of them are made out of copper alloy. There is also evidence of some of them being made with iron. The actual blade of the plane tends to be set between 40 and 45 degrees. So it's you know, fairly steep. So we've got finds of planes from, from various places, from Denmark to Ireland. We've got finds of planes uh, and accompanying other tools that we also get in the Mestimir chest, which um, I really enjoy because it speaks to this uniformity of form, to this common form of tools um, that really goes from, in some places, the Bronze Age through to the present day, and even the Stone Age, the Neolithic through to the present day, things like axes and adzes, uh, the shape and form of those developed really, really early uh, in terms of hand tools developing archeologically. Um, one of the other items that we have that is really interesting is from Hedeby and it is an antler clamp. And this antler clamp is often interpreted as being used for comb making. And combs in the Viking Age are often made from organic materials, so bone, antler, horn and so on. Horn combs are very common up to the present day. Uh, and antler combs are constructed slightly differently where you'll have a base plate and then the plates for the tip. Here's one. That's how they're made. Thanks editing, Jimmy. Um, you have a base plate with the plates riveted into it that will then form the teeth. Often they're decorated, um, highly decorated with cross hatching and ring and dot motifs. Some of them have a little case that they go into as well, which is really sweet. And you use a very fine saw. Some people I'm told use a wire uh, and you cut into the antler. You cut into the antler or the bone, or whatever you're using. Um, to form the teeth, then you smooth the tops, you, you shape the tops of the teeth with a file. Um, and the antler clamp is interpreted as being used to hold an antler comb, um, possibly because they're sort of the same hardness and it's not gonna cause damage to the antler. Um, you could use a piece of cloth, obviously, to sheath it. Um, but there's, there's no, as far as I'm aware, there's no evidence that that's what it was used for, but it's a nice interpretation. So there are potentially these even further specialised pieces of kit where you have an antler, when you're making an antler comb, you'll need an antler clamp because you don't want to use a, a metal clamp because you'll, you'll damage the antler. And I just love that idea that there are people putting this much thought and time and skill into designing and making the tools to then design and make these artefacts that survive for a thousand years in the ground and we still consider beautifully made master crafted pieces. I think that's wonderful, isn't it? It's fabulous. There are so many things uh, that we take for granted, like you go to the shop and you buy a bag of a hundred nails, when in the Mestimir chest we have a nail iron. A nail iron is a piece of iron that you use to whack pieces of metal in to make your nails. 
Like you have to make those nails by hand. You shape that nail by hand. You file it down or you shape it when it's hot to make your nails. You hand forge every single nail. Uh, yeah, you can make half a dozen of them half a dozen of them at a time using this nail iron that we've got but you're still making those things you're hot and you're sweaty and you're making nails um, even stuff like wire like you go to the shop now you buy 100 yards of wire on a roll for 50p a blacksmith had to draw that wire through a draw plate to make it into wire and get thinner and thinner through thinner and thinner holes it's a painstaking job you take the pains to make this stuff and that's how male armor was made like you draw the wire through draw plates you punch a hole through each of those rings you then put a rivet through them and you clench that rivet shut individually 45,000 times in the right order in the right shapes like a huge amount of effort went into making objects in the viking age and that doesn't just apply to the crafted items, that applies to the tools, because somebody made those axes and adzes and spoon gouges and drills and sheet metal snips. Somebody had to make them out of raw materials with their two sweaty hands. It, it's a mind-boggling amount of labour, and it puts to bed, puts a pillow over the head and smothers to death the idea that people were just making lump and crap in the Viking Age, that they were these brutal, barbaric, low-tech people. You only need to look at the Oseberg ship graves to see that people were making spectacular pieces of kit. Okay, maybe it's a royal burial, but I'm pretty sure that royals today have better kit on their wrists and better kit on their feet than you're wearing. Most of the people watching this video probably aren't knocking around in a Lamborghini for example this is the equivalent to that there were people who could afford the Mestamir craftspeople who could make you a nice bit of moulding for your door lintel they could do you a couple of nice stamps on your metalwork and they could repair your cauldron in exchange for some silver or some scrap metal for them to use later on or you could afford the people that made the incredible silverware that's on display at the British Museum you know there's always a scale uh, there's always a scale in crafting. Um, maybe the Mestamir craftspeople could make things like the Osseberg beds and figurehead, um, but until those customers are available and commissioning things from you, you repair farmers' tools, you work itinerantly in the bogs of Sweden, you do what you can, you fix doors and window frames, help put up barns, make nails and clench bolts and do what you can maybe at some point somebody will want a ship to go raiding with and you'll get to make a really cool clinker built viking longship but until somebody commissions us to make our clinker built viking longship friends uh that's probably going to be it for now i've put some links to some some reading and some some cool images of tools in the description but i am always in awe of master craftsmen so let this video be dedicated to the master handcrafts people of the world, you blacksmiths, you carpenters, you leather workers, you shoemakers, you 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 knife and cutlers, you you swordsmiths, all of you guys are absolute heroes and you're keeping crafts alive that deserve to be kept alive and that are essential uh, for the things that we really need in life. Um, we don't need digital cameras and wireless Bluetooth microphones, but we sure as hell need bowls and knives and forks and shoes. So thank you all for all of the amazing work that you do, and you're very much appreciated. So thank you very much, Amma uh, Minna, for joining. And as ever, thank you to all my lovely patrons. Thank you, Ali, for the wonderful and incredibly well-timed book and the wool. Um, thank you to everybody who's been asking how I am when I've been taking a holiday. Thank you to my patrons. If you want to uh, support the channel financially, we have the Patreon link and the coffee link in the description, as ever. Like, smash the like button, yada yada yada. Thank you very much for joining. Till the next time. Bye bye.
I've made another cat friend. Look at him. Look how nice he is. Look at my nice cat friend. Meow, meow. Meow, meow, meow.